Okay, everybody, ready for chapter 11. It's, it is possible that Martine would have continued to settle in Caracas school in spite of her shyness and would eventually have made friends. But on her third Sunday in Africa, something happened to change everything. It started with the school outing to Kirsten Bosch National Bot Botanical Center in Cape Town, link below, a place where Miss Faulkner told them of incomparable marvels when it comes to the plant kingdom. Throughout the week, Miss Faulkner had drummed them into a state of excitement about it, promising them a weekend treat, retreat they would never forget, during which they would explore things like fragrance and medicine gardens and enjoy a special picnic at the foot of Table Mountain while watching a world-renowned African band. Martine had looked forward to the trip with some trepidation and was very relieved when a short time after boarding the bus at noon on Sunday, she found she was enjoying herself. There was a good atmosphere on the way into Cape Town and some of the children were telling jokes and singing. Why was six cross, Cheryl and Meyer asked Martine? Because seven, eight, nine. Eight, nine, do you get it? Martine was laughing harder than she actually meant to when she caught the sight of Ben, alone, as usual, at the back of the bus. She looked away guiltily. Maybe today she would try to find a way to speak to him, to distract herself. She reflected on the conversation with Alex two days previously. The way he had talked, anyone would think there was a conspiracy at Simbana to reserve the secret of the white giraffe until it could be captured and sold for a king's ransom. And yet both Tende and Gwen Thomas had insisted to her that it was a myth. Either Alex knew more than they did, or they were lying. Martine thought again about her encounter with the white giraffe, about the moment when she first saw him towering above her, shimmering white like the sun on snow, with patches of silver tinges with cinnamon. A shiver of excitement went through her. Nothing on earth could stop her from seeing Jemmy again. No storms, no lock, no game warden, no threat. Nothing was more important than the white giraffe. The, sequel, the squeal of the bus brakes interrupted Martine's thought. They were entering gate two of Kirsten Bosch Botanical Gardens. As, as she waited to get off, she stole a glance at Ben. He didn't seem to have noticed that the bus had stopped. He was staring out at the paradise of trees and flowers and Table Mountain rising into the blue sky behind it. His face was alive with anticipation. At the Kirsten Bosch Nature Study School, smiling staff greeted them with fruit juice and a lecture on the botanical gardens, which had been established in 1913, and they were spread over a massive 1,300 acres. After that, they were split into three groups of eight. Two of the groups were to explore Kirsten Bosch with an educational officer, but Martine's group, which consisted of four members of the Five Star Gang, everyone except for Piter, plus Sherilyn, a big sporty boy called Jake, and Ben was to be led by Miss Volkler, who had done a special course at the center to enable her to guide them. Their first stop was at the Fragrance Gardens. Link below. They stood out over manicured lawns where tourist picnics and guinea fowl hovered, hopefully for tidbits, crossing Bubbly Brook along the way. It looked innocent enough, but it had a brutal and bloody history as an escape route of slaves in the days when the British ruled over the Cape Colony. Legend has it that it was one slave who escaped here. He was eaten by a leopard. And all that was found of him was a skeleton, Miss Faulkner told them. Ever since then, this is known, has been known as Skeleton Stream and the area above Skeleton Gorge. The older forest beside it was called Donker Gate, African for dark corner, she added for effect. Many a child has been lost up there. An echo passed through Mar Martine, a sort of a chill. Her eyes followed Miss Faulkner, pointing a finger at the forbid forbidding slopes of Table Mountain, where forests of yellow wood and ironwood sprawled in a dense green carpet. The scene looked familiar as if she'd seen it before in a photograph. Goosebumps rose on her arms. Less than an hour ago, the sky had been clear with only a few wisps of clouds over the mountain, but already the day was turning ugly. They had been warned about the unpredictability of the weather, for no particular reason Martine felt suddenly apprehensive. The fragrance and medicinal gardens were wonderful, were wonderlands of aromatic plants and he healing herbs, and Martine found it difficult to concentrate. 
At the dell, they drank from an ice-cold spring in a bird-shaped bath, and then it was off to Cicada Amphitheater, where Miss Volkner explained that the palm-like cicadas were actually living fossils that were around them at the time of the dinosaurs. Some of them are 200 million years old, she said. Can you believe that? 200 million years old. The final stages of their journey was in the Fibonacci Swap on the lower slopes of the mountain. The Fibonacci was one of the world's six plant kingdoms and was unique to the Cape region. It consisted of heather-type bushes like bright red fire hearts, silver trees, reeds, lilies, and pink velvety proteas, which were African's national flower, sprawling along the winding paths in a blaze of color and made for a spectacular display. When they reached the Protea Garden, Miss Volkner showed them the orange-headed nodding pincushion flower, a favorite nectar of sugar birds. Just then, a beeper went off. She checked with the grimace, the wind whipping her curly hair. Okay, everyone, pay attention, she called. One of the other children has suffered an allergic reaction to a bee sting, and I'm urgently needed back at the nature study school. It would be a shame for you to miss out on seeing the sugar bird seeds, so I'm going to trust you to stay here quietly and wait for them. Under no circumstances does anyone go wandering off. Luke and Lucy, as perfects, I'm putting you in charge. If I'm not back in the next 20 minutes, follow the signs to the concert area, and I'll meet you there. As soon as Miss Walkner was out of sight, mayhem erupted. No one apart from Martine seemed to have the slightest interest in seeing the sugar bird speed. There were a few other visitors in the Proti Garden, but the noise of the children soon drove them away. Martine decided that now would be a good time to try to talk to Ben. She walked through the flower beds in search of him, but he was nowhere to be seen. Where's Ben? she asked Lucy. Who knows, the blonde girl said. Probably hugging in a tree or something. Sh Sherilyn interrupted. What's happening to the sky? Eight heads tipped upward. The wispy clouds had become a vaporous gray blanket. It was consumed the top half of the mountain and was sliding furiously down the cliffs toward Kirstenbosch, driven by the wind. But the really creepy part was the sky, which boiled with an odd violet light. It looked less, less like a storm and was approaching more of some sort of weather phenomenon like a tornado or a tempest. Please, can we go back now? It's freezing, whined Sherilyn, but the process of extreme weather had the atmosphere of silliness, and the other children started chasing moss through the Brochy Garden. The sounds of the marimbas, conga drums, and African voices rising in exquisite harmony came to them on the gusting wind. The bandits started playing. A flash of memory seared in Martine's brain. It was music from her dream. She was sure of it. That explained it. That's why Kirsten Bosch was so familiar. Her dream was becoming a reality. And this was the exact scene. The looming gray mountain, the plum-colored light, the swallowing clouds, and the children chasing moth through the proteas. Any minute now, someone would go, Hey, look what I found. Hey! Luke was standing by a stack of wood slates that sort of used there was used to create a fence. His voice said, Look what I found. The others rushed to his side. Martine included, although warning bells were clanging like a sixty piece orchestra in her head. The Egyptian gray goose lay on the ground. It was a large bird with reddish brown and white wings, but one of those wings hung broken, and its webbed feet curled limply at its breast. It started up it stared up at the peering faces with one red eye. Though it flapped feebly, it was unable to move. Luke scooped the bird up and it honked hoarsely in protest. I bet it's been attacked by a fox. Miss Volkner here says there's foxes around. Put it down, Luke, Lucy snapped at her brother. It's probably diseased. Yeah, Luke, it's dirty, agreed Jake. Martine tried to speak, but no sound came out. Maybe we should put it out of its misery, Luke suggested. You know, hit it over the head or something? Jake laughed. How about rah, and a nice little barbecue? We can put it on the spit. Should go. Should be enough to go around. Martine found her voice. She said cheerfully, please leave it alone. Please don't hurt it. Ah, uh, poor little English girl, jeered Luke. Sighing like a baby. You want it? Here, have it. Patch. He launched the goose at Martine, who flailed blindly for the brown blur and unprepared for the weight of it, tripped and toppled over backwards. Somehow she managed to hold on to it through her fall. She struggled into the kneeling position with the goose still 
cradled in her arms. Her face flushed scarlet with anger and embarrassment. The other kids were just bursting out laughing. Did you see that? Jake crowded delightedly. That was priceless. He mimicked Martine's windmill arms and, and voice. Please don't hurt me. Caught up in the madness of the moment, none of the children noticed that Martine had closed her eyes and was trembling violently. She was remembering the goose in her dream. The goose, too, had a tiny pulse beating in its throat. The brown silken feathers that were warm to the touch. This bird's eyes slid shut, and she watched it. Martine's first thought is that she had to save it. Her second was, how? Then a voice in her head, a voice she recognized as Grace's, said, you know what to do, child. And right at that instant, Martine realized that she did know what to do, that she had always known all her life. Her hands ceased trembling and heated up to the point where they were practically glowing. After a few section, section, seconds, the Egyptian goose jerked and its eyelids flickered. She loosened her palms and shook out its wing and flew into the darkening sky. The world swam, the world, the world swam into focus again. Her classmates were staring at her with a mixture of fear, horror, and disbelief. The color had drained from Luke's face, and he was backing away from her as if she was possessed. Hey, how'd you do that? What are you, some kind of witch? Martine was just as bewildered as he was. For an instant, her palms were at their hottest. She felt the power of the ancient as the earth go through her like an ocean wave, and had seen in a puff of smoke a possession of what she could only imagine were spirits. African in antelope mask and rhinoceros breathing fire. Dazed and shaky, all she could think of was, so this is the gift. What is it, Luke was yelling her. Is it black magic, voodoo? That's, maybe she's a Mswadunti. I can't pronounce it. I'll put a picture. That's Zulu word for wizard or witch. Someone who believes, who bewitches others or casts spells on them. Be careful, she might change you into a bat or a bird. Martine stuttered, I'm not... I'm not a witch. You know, in South Africa, people say that there's only one thing you can do with a witch. They must be eliminated. Otherwise, they do evil things. Martine cast a desperate glance down at the mount, hoping to see the sturdy figure of Miss Volkner coming to call for them for a picnic. No one was there. You wouldn't, she said in a small voice. Nobody answered, but Jake took a threatening step toward her. Martine made a move toward the path that led to the main center, but the other children cut her off. She looked beseechingly at Lucy, but the blonde girl was wearing the same superfluous expression she had adopted whenever she spoke about Ben. That's when she knew that things were serious. Martine spun on her heel and fled into the twilight, screaming for help as she went. But the band dried up, drowned out her cries. She ran down a short hill over the nursery stream and into the evergreen forest. Only then did she realize she made her mistake. Ahead of her was a daunting wall of 330 steps. She halted, panting, unsure what to do, but the clattering of feet and cries of her pursuers on the wooden bridge jolted her into action. She flew up the steps as if the hounds of hell were on her tail. With everyone, with everyone the agony in her legs increased as her breath burned like acid in her chest. At the top of the road, but... At the top of it was a road, but no signs. Martine knew she wouldn't be able to keep going for much longer, so she plunged into the wilderness of yellow trees. Better to be lost than to be caught. Once in the green, green dark of the forest, she could no longer hear the noise of the city, just the tinkle of the stream and the faint whisper of the twitter birds, bats, and snakes high up in the canopy. I've got to end here because we're out of time. My next recording... I'll finish this chapter and go on to the next.